Magnus violated the edicts of Nicaea and, using magic, tried to warn the emperor about the betrayal of Horus. Unfortunately, Magnus did not know how much trouble he caused in his desperate attempt to help his father. By breaching the psychic defenses of the Imperial Palace, Magnus's sorcery demolished it, causing a series of catastrophes across terror and opening warp storms around it. The Emperor's disappointment and anger knew no bounds. An immediate decree was issued for the accusation and arrest of Magnus the Red for violating the laws made at the Council of Nicaea. By the word and the will of the Master of Mankind, Imperator Imperatoris Terra Regnum, it is hereby decreed that Magnus, Primarch of the Fifteen Legiones Astartes, be brought forth in censure and bound by law to stand before the throne Imperial of Terra, there to answer for his actions and those of his gene sons. To this end is Lehman Rus, Primarch of the Six Legiones Astartes, so charged upon the deliverance of his brother by any and all means he may find needful, without limit in law, sanction, or imposition of attainder, unto the limitless void and the last day. So it is written, so it shall be. The decree condemning Magnus and the Thousand Sons. The decree was immediately sent to the Primarch of the Space Wolves Legion and Horus. The Emperor hoped that the Primarch could offer wise counsel, and he also ordered the assembly of an army that was to arrest Magnus and accompany him to terror, and, if necessary, to capture him by force. Constantine Valdor, Captain General of the ancient Legio Custode, one of the Emperor's closest advisers, was appointed as the commander of the prosecuting force. Since Terra was the main fortress of the entire Imperium and the nearby Mars was the main forge of humanity's war machine, the troops were assembled quite quickly. The army consisted of dozens of tyrannic auxilia regiments and Imperial soldiers. The army was also accompanied by the Sisters of Silence, the most powerful weapon of the Imperium against Psykers, and the newly formed Ordo Sinister, a legion of Bane Lord class Titan and the Emperor. It was unique in that its arsenal included incredibly rare Psy Titans, combat machines controlled by perpetually suffering Psykers, allowing the main operator of the Titan to use some abilities of the warp energy. When everything was ready, the prosecuting force set off for the planet Prospero. However, their advance was slowed down by warp storms around Terra. At the time of receiving the message from the Emperor, Lehman Russ was assisting the armies of the Imperium with another threat from the Xenos. It is recorded that, upon receiving the order from his father, Russ quickly prepared a decisive attack at the centre of the enemy forces and crushed it. However, he immediately retreated with his legion and headed to the home planet of the Space Wolves, Fenris, in order to prepare for the offensive. It is difficult to say whether such zeal was due to loyalty to the Emperor or if Wolf King's rage and malice towards his brother, whom Russ had never trusted, played a role. Upon arriving at his homeland, Russ convened all the great companies of his legion that were relatively close to their star system. The Wolf King spent about a month gathering the forces of his legion, and without waiting for the full assembly, advanced to meet Valdor with 50,000 space marines. Their meeting place was the Beta Garmin star cluster. However, due to warp storms around Terra, and the relative proximity to this system, the Space Wolves arrived at the meeting place one and a half months before Valdor. Russ was greeted by those who responded to the call of his legion's strength and part of the sons of Horus's forces. The main task of the 16th Legion was to deliver a message from Russ from a warrior. It is not known exactly what Horus conveyed to his brother. But after this message, Russ intended not just to capture Magnus, but also to execute him, even though this was not a directive from their father. For this purpose, Horus allocated 5,000 of his legionnaires and 12 titans to assist Lehman Russ. When the prosecution force from Terra arrived in the Beta Garmin star cluster one and a half months later, the meeting between Russ and Valdor took place. Their meeting was tense. Both had deep respect for each other. However, Valdor was firmly intent on executing the Emperor's directive as precisely as possible, while it was believed that killing the traitor sorcerer would better serve the Imperium. Eventually, Valdor agreed with Russ, but their disagreements continued throughout the war. Some more time passed, 
before the prosecution force set off for Prospero. During the preparation phase, strategies were devised for the union of forces so different in spirit, and Russ demanded careful study of the planet and its military fortifications. Advancing across the planet of Magnus, the prosecution forces seized space stations and those belonging to the Thousand Suns. However, all of them turned out to be empty. They also did not encounter ships belonging to the Sorcerer's Legion. It turned out that Magnus had long known about the approaching force. Instead of ordering the fortification of his system's borders, or at least strengthening the planet's defence, the Crimson King, on the contrary, concentrated his fleet's forces as far from each other as possible. And although he gathered a large part of his legion on Prospero, the Thousand Suns were unaware of the impending invasion until the last moment. Magnus completely cut off any means of communication with the rest of the Imperium, including Psychic. Even without preparation and defence, Tizka, the capital and the only major city on Prospero, was very well fortified. On one side, there were impenetrable jungles inhabited by dangerous predators, the strangest and most deadly of which were invisible swarms of psychic parasites. On the other side, the capital was encircled by mountains, fortified with numerous bunkers and defensive laser installations. From a third aspect, the city was embraced by the sea, and from a fourth, a wall standing 100 metres tall was erected, protected by Geller fields, while the city itself was covered by a psychic kind shield as strong as a void shield, which is usually mounted on space cruisers. Additionally, the Adeptus Mechanicus, who maintained a forge on the planet, as well as the challenging landscape for landing, disagreements in command, and the prosecutorial force's unpreparedness for a prolonged siege, could significantly aid in defence. Initially, this was merely an honour guard for the arrest and escort of Magnus. All this created significant difficulties for the impending siege. It remains unclear why Magnus intentionally scattered his fleet across the system and did not warn his legion of the attack. Some believe this was a mere display of pride. Others speak of an attempt at redemption, while others whisper of the mysterious plans of the dark gods that whispered to Magnus. For Russ and Valdor, this remained a mystery. Within a few hours, the prosecutorial force had completely captured the orbital space around Prospero, almost without meeting resistance. The destruction and capture of orbital stations caused panic among the planet's population. The panic was further exacerbated by the ensuing orbital bombardment. However, Russ did not wish to simply subject Prospero to exterminatus from orbit. He wanted to give Magnus a chance to explain himself and attempt to justify his actions. An Imperial decree was broadcast to the planet demanding Magnus's surrender. However, no threats of resistance nor pleas for mercy came from the surface, nothing at all. Russ was offended by his brother's silence, and despite Valdor's pleas to allow more time for a response, he ordered the commencement of mass bombardment. Prospero was set ablaze. An hour after the bombardment, the planet's surface was left in ashes. Only the capital managed to withstand, shielded by the psychic shield. It was only then that the truth about such protective nature around the capital was revealed to Valdor and Russ. Meaning, Magnus had once again blatantly violated the Edict of Nikaya and betrayed the Emperor's trust. The preparation for the siege began. Although the capital survived the bomb strikes, the defensive line in the mountains around Tizka had been destroyed and the outskirts of the city were buried under rocks while the sea that lapped the capital's shores had almost entirely evaporated, blasting the coastline with a wave of steam. Tizka also lost its allies. The Adeptus Mechanicus and their forge was destroyed, including the deep underground complexes. Russ vowed that his warriors would be the first to commence warfare on this planet. Then he asked the Allied forces to be in reserve. He began preparing his legion for the siege. Descending to the coastline of Tizka on a transporter, the Space Wolves broke through the air defences of Prospero. The first to set foot on the land was Lehman Russ himself, as he had vowed, emitting an inhuman roar, which signified the command to attack. The Wolf King led his sons into battle. The Wolves immediately met resistance from the elite guard of Tizka, and what could an ordinary guardsman do against the beastly fury of the Emperor's wildest legion? 
Surprisingly for the attackers, they were opposed only by the regular army. The Legion of the Thousand Sons and their Primarch had yet to show themselves. Meanwhile, the army of Prospero attempted to sell their lives dearly, displaying acts of heroism in each encounter. However, the air forces had already been completely destroyed, and only a few fortified positions of the infantry remained, desperately resisting the deadly wave of the invader. Important moments of the first stage of the siege included the destruction of the fortresses of the Acropolis Magna. The troops of Rus had captured the entire region of Old Tisca and continued their advancement. The wolves were unleashed, and now nothing could prevent them from reaping a bloody harvest. Any requests for truce from the residents of the capital were ignored. Russ also disregarded the suggestion from Valdor to finally deploy the reserves into battle. The Wolf King wanted to draw the Legion of Magnus into battle and settle scores with it personally. As a provocation, a huge stone statue of the Crimson King was destroyed. Finally, as the attack progressed deeper into the city, a volley of bolt of fire and flashes from sorcerer's projectiles ran through the ranks of the Sixth Legion. The Thousand Sons responded to the call of the wolf. Thanks to their magical talents, the Legion of Magnus halted the wolf's advancement, effectively repelling their attacks and inflicting significant damage. Russ, unwilling to lose the initiative, ordered to hold the positions and finally called in the reserves. The Space Wolves' reserves were ordered to continue moving towards the center of Tizka and to bypass the enemy forces, if possible. Russ hoped he had already engaged the enemy's main forces in battle. It turned out that the Wolf King had underestimated the situation. By this point, the Thousand Sons had long abandoned hopes of redemption and were invoking ever more terrible and destructive spells. Seeing that the wolves' attack was failing, Constantine Valdor directed his forces to assist. He summoned all the remaining forces of the Imperium in orbit, reinforcing the attacking squads and destroying the remaining pockets of resistance in the rear of the wolves' legion. The main target of the attack was the capture of the spires located in the very centre of the city. The Thousand Sons, unbound by prohibitions, conducted secret rituals and sacrifices to discern the plans of the invaders and to use the darkest and most forbidden spells. Even the Adeptus Custodes, led by Valdor, were stunned by the incredible power that was unleashed upon the Loyalist forces. All forces of the Prosecution Army were shocked by how far the Sons of Magnus had fallen. Russ and his legion disowned the Thousand Sons as their brothers and swore to erase the city and its inhabitants to dust, sparing no one. Valdor was also determined to the utmost. He gathered all the Sisters of Silence under his command, which became the decisive action. As across all fronts, the Thousand Sons successfully halted the attack of the Loyalists. Even the Wolf King could not advance further. However, Thanks to the devastating effect that the Sisters of Silence had on the Psyche Thousand Sons, Valdor managed to successfully break through the traitor's defense. At this moment, Tisker turned into a veritable hell. A warp storm began above the planet. The moon of Prospero eclipsed the sun. Gradually, the warp storm descended upon the capital, engulfing its central part. Everything that was on the edge of the warp storm was consumed by it. However, inside it, one could still be found. It was there that the main forces of Russ and Valdor continued to press on the Legion of Thousand Sons. The Legion of Magnus retreated to the central spire where the Crimson King had been located throughout the siege. The forces of the Loyalists now had to also repel the spawns of the Immaterium, which appeared in the worlds of dark warp energy. And finally, when the forces of the Imperium surrounded the remnants of the defending Thousand Sons, the Crimson King himself appeared on the battlefield. The brother Primarchs immediately engaged in combat, while Valdor ordered the Legion of Rus and his troops to continue the assault, not interfering with the duel of the brothers. Overuse of their powers and warp connection had resulted in flesh change. Therefore, the last battle was even more brutal than the previous fights in Tizka. At last, Valdor's forces pushed the Thousand Sons back inside the spire itself, in which the peaceful population was also hiding. Valdor's order was simple. Everything inside the spire must die. 
At that very moment, Russ secured victory over his brother, breaking his back over his knee and raising his weapon for the final blow. However, before the blow was struck and Valdor's warriors approached the spire, a flash of incredibly bright light enveloped the central building. A magical whirlwind swirled around it, inhuman laughter was heard. Terrible demons materialized on the battlefield and began to destroy the blinded forces of the Imperium. The space around began to go mad. It seemed as if the last spells of Magnus had destroyed the very concept of reality. Then the light vanished, as did the spire and the Crimson King himself. In despair, Magnus surrendered to the will of the Chaos God, Zinch, of change, knowledge and sorcery. The war was over. The forces of the Emperor won, but at a great cost. Even though Rus defeated his brother, he did not fulfill his oath to kill him. The Imperium lost an entire legion of space marines, and as it would turn out in the future, it gained a formidable enemy. For the first time, space marines spilled the blood of their brothers in open confrontation. Lemon Russ was deeply depressed by all this, and even the ceremonial congratulations from Horus did not comfort him. Such irony to receive congratulations from the one who secretly rejoiced at the successful execution of his plans and the plans of the Dark Gods. The Wolf King is yet to learn of the great slaughter that was planned for the warriors.